You know, that's, that's BS. I, you know, myself, I'm not pro-death, I'm not anti-death. I don't believe in state executions because they pick and choose. There was a case back in 84 when I was being tried with Alejandro Hernandez and Stephen Buckley. It was a little black girl, 10 years old. She was raped and murdered, almost identical to the Caracol case, but it was out of Lombard, Illinois. And those three defendants, they were black kids. They got 20, 40, and 60 years. Never once did DuPage County even seek a death penalty or even mention a death penalty. And those are the same prosecutors that prosecuted them, prosecuted us. Because it wasn't a little white girl out of a middle, high middle class neighborhood. So it didn't matter. She was out of the projects. Didn't mean shit. That was just reality. And then they want to turn around and say, well, why are you frustrated? Why do you come out? You know, why don't you just be quiet? Now why don't you just leave everybody alone? You know what? Why didn't everybody leave me alone? Why did they come to me? Why did they harass me? Why did they mess with us in there? Why did they keep out? They knew that we didn't do it. They just kept out. Why do I have to lose everything I have? It happens. It's life. I speak now because I don't want everybody to sit there and think that it was okay or it's okay now that they cleaned it up and everything's fine. It's okay. It's not. It's not. People have to come out. They have to stand up for the truth. They have to stand up for what's real, whether it's in law, journalism, whether it's it's just everyday life. You know, it's it's the after effects. The after effects hurt more than what was going on there because there I knew what I was up against. There I knew how to fight it. There, it was, it wasn't reality what was happening at first until they came up. On January 4th, 84, with this, or 85, they came up with this vicious statement out of nowhere. It was one line they said. That's what they claimed. There was one line, one sentence. By the time they testified, because Alan Vosberg testified at the first trial, it became a 45 minute. By one, it was a 25 minute account. The other one said 45 minutes. Then Manasano came and threw in his dust. And then in the next trial, it was even longer. And after the next trial, it was even longer. And they knew that we were going to come out at the third trial with the truth. But they still went ahead and lied anyway. It's the same, and, and, it, and it hurt so bad because it's, it's screwed up my whole life. Like any of my wives, I could have gave them another chance, but I can't because of this shit, because of lies. They lied to me, how would you? I don't want nothing to do with you. That's it. Because I don't know what they're going to do. What are they going to do? Turn around and set me up for something I didn't do? I already, I did already set me up for something I didn't do. I went in when I was 20 years old, two months and five days. I came out when I was 32 and a half years old. I mean, they just screwed me out of everything. You know, I had a daughter who was born in there. You know, I've been blessed by God, you know, and they have more kids now, but I don't even have them, you know. Mother's already talked to my son and said, I wanted to talk to him. Justice. It was never justice. People ask me that. Did you receive justice and compensation? You don't get compensated. How can you compensate somebody for what you've done to them? You can't compensate anybody for what, they, what they've done to me. There's no way to compensate them. There's no way. There's nothing that they can do to change it. I mean, that's why it's called history. It's, it's done. It's over. You can learn from it. And that's what I want people to do. That's why I speak out. People need to learn to go forward to do better how would anybody like it or not when i was in there they didn't like it when when i in and, and february 2nd my baby sister's birthday she turned 10 years old my now. daughter's birthday i took over my case i got rid of judge stone susan valentine everybody i got rid of mom i did my first interview with muriel fair that's my daughter samira muriel was named after her. and i did my first interview that day because i looked in the back when I looked behind me, they were reading out the guilty charges. And Muriel was the first media person that was always there. And she turned, the first time I'd seen her turn, and she grabbed my mother and my sister and hugged them and said no, no to every charge. She kept saying no. And I went, and I demanded to do an interview with her. And I got my interview with her. And I said, this is, this is it. I'm taking over. Everybody told me, you're stupid. How can you do that? You, you, know, you don't know what you're doing. I was learning law when I was in there by Dickie Gaines. He was in there with me. He taught me law. And um, me and John Hamlin and Tim Gableson, I told him, I went back there from the State Public Defender's Office in Illinois, and I told him that 
either they represent me or I'll represent myself. It was going to be that easy. Nobody else was going to do it. Because contrary to everybody thinking that John, that Tom Green, Man owned them, got me out. Yeah, they were the, one of the main factors that got me out. There's no doubt that defense team was the best. <coughs> but if it wasn't for John Hannon, Tim Gabelson, Chuck Scheidel, and everybody at State Appellate Defender's Office, I wouldn't be here today because they're the ones that won my first appeal. They're the ones that kept me from being executed the very first time. So it's to them I take my hat off to first and foremost every single day. And um, later they helped me and we started interviewing people and talking. It wasn't contrary. A lot of people try to tell me, well, lawyers just wanted your case. You know, they wanted, they want to make money off their fame. Well, these lawyers are all rich and they're all famous already before I even came into their lives. And none of them came into my life wanting to take the case. I can tell you that right now. Tom Breen, I consider him my dad. And it's real funny, I told him, I said, uh, I said, so we're talking, the interview was over. And I told him, I said, I have one question for you to Mr. Breen, what's that? I said, uh, do you believe I'm innocent? Because I never go around telling people that. So what do you think? He goes, well, from, my, from what I've read and I gather, yeah. I said, so you're just going to let me sit here and be executed for a fucking murder I didn't commit? He says, is that what you were going to do? I said, man, I don't even want to talk to you. And he left. But I did that for a reason. Matt Kennelly came in afterwards a couple days later, almost a week later, and we were talking. And I asked him if he'd come back again. And he came back. And I told him, I have one question left for you. And he said, what's that? And I said, your wife's name is Lee, and you get your kids, right? He said, yeah. And I said, go home and ask them first if you can represent me. Because you don't know this case. I know this case better than anybody. To this day, I know this case better than anybody. I've read all them damn transcripts over and over and over from every trial, every appeal, everything. And it's going to consume your life. It's going to take you away from, away from your kids. That's the sacrifice they're going to have to make. I'm telling you, this case is a haunt, man. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt you. And I talked to Larry Marshall the same way. And, um, Matt came back and he says, I, I met with Lee and she said, yeah, she said, let's go for it. Let's do it. And I said, all right. And I said, I appreciate it. And I called Tom up about a week after that. So about a month had passed. I said, how are you doing? He goes, all right. And I said, you know, you're a real ass, man. You're just going to let me sit there and die. And so let me do it. And he goes, wait a minute now. He goes, you don't tell me that. He goes, you know, you made me feel like shit when I left that day. He goes, I've been wanting to talk to you. He goes, can we talk again? I said, not unless you're going to represent me. And he was like, what? And I said, well, I don't want you to represent me. Because I, mean, I got my response from him. He felt like shit out of it. You know, he, he, you know, it, it, it touched something in him. I mean, these are the people that I have as family now, because I, I have nobody else. You know, and I don't see them that much, because I live in Wisconsin. They're here. But, um, why is you know, your family? My mom, 